This interview is part of our Road to EF series. You can find the rest by clicking here. Die Seed Entrances Roguelikuk, that places your fate in the role of a die. However, with each class and ability, you can attempt to shape what happens with each role. Got all super set down with Terry Kavanagh, Marlow Dop, Annie at Houston. Some of the development team behind the Excellence in Design nominated title to talk about how they brought strategy to the chaotic log cover die role and how 90s game shows helped influence the look of the game. Kevin Ack, hey, I am Terry Kevin Ack, and I am the designer. I am also one of the game's programmers, along with Justin Delgado. I have been at Indie Dev for about 10 years. I made the VVVV and Super Hexagon, and also lots of random free weird things. Dog, I am Marlo Dog, and I am the artist and animator. I have been working as an artist in games for about 2 years now. Mostly web games, game jams, and unreleased projects. Before that, I was doing all sorts of odd job. Freelance illustration work. My involvement with my local Portland game adapt scene through Portland. In the Game Squad, a non-profit of which I am now an organizer, was a big push for me to go from doing freelance illustration to video games full time. Houston, I am not at Houston, Alka Chipsel, and I work on everything audio related in the game. I have been focused primarily on composing music for video games for the past six to seven years. Kevin Ack, Dicey Dungeon started as a jam game for last year's seven-day roguelike. I was really inspired by having recently gotten back into Dream Quest, which is one of my favorite games, and I just really wanted to try making my own deck builder for a seven-day row. Using dice was initially just a dumb idea. I had to try to take that basic premise off in a new direction. But that's the great thing that sometimes happens with game jams occasionally. If you are very lucky, you just hit on something that ends up being way more than you expected. As I worked on the game more and more, it became clear that this combination of deck building and dice assignment had way way more depth to than I initially realized. I have been kind of obsessed with the idea ever since. Kevin Ack, the calm mechanics of dicey dungeons are, you explore a dungeon, find equipment, and fight monsters. In combat, you assign dice that you roll to your equipment, and it does different things depending on what you roll. A really simple example is the basic sword, which can take any dice. And just that much damage to HP on a 2, 6 HP on a 6, or whatever. But then you get equipment that does different things or not. A Riven Rolls. A equipment that splits your dice into two dice. A equipment which can only take a fire, but does something really powerful with it. Start adding all these combinations together, and cool stuff starts happening. What's really exciting about the card design of the game to me is that it's sorta of like an inversion of a PG combat mechanics. Instead of making moves and waiting to see what the ring does, you get the ring up front, and you get to decide how to make the best of it. I find that basic twist really, really compelling, and I think it's what makes the game so much fun to play. Dog. I use both Adobe Photoshop and After Effects. Houston, all the music was written in Lysi, with a Nintendo Game Boy. Most of the sound effects were made using my Eurorack system, and various different synthesizers. Kevin Ack, I am using Hex, with OPNFL and Starling. I love working in Hex, and I think more people should check it out. Kevin Ack, yeah. It's not really a one-to-one -one map with standard deck building mechanics. One of the big challenges has been equipment layouts. In Dicey Dungeons, unlike most other deck builders, you do not draw cards from a pool instead. You have a static layout, 
that you can change between battles. I found early on that the combination of both playing random cards and rolling random dice led to a game just feeling little chaotic. So I decided to focus instead on static layouts, with the exception of one character, the Jester, who's explicitly exploring that variation. Figuring out that balance between strategy and chaos has been the hardest thing to get right. Kevin act mechanically. They all came about from trying to figure out different answers to the same question. How do you introduce uncertainty into each run to keep the place you make from round to your round interesting? So, the warrior gets to reroll dice. The thief uses a lock pick, which splits dice randomly and steals enemy equipment. The robot has a push your lock blackjack style mechanic, a getting more dice, and so on. Dog, visually, a lot of how the characters ended up had to do with making them look as distinct from one another as possible. All the characters are D6 of course, so the challenge was to find the right visual archetypes, facial features, outfits, and colors to set them apart from one another, despite having the same base body. Dog, the art style itself, is very emblematic of my own style, as an artist. Far dicey dungeons. It felt like such a fresh fit particularly, because it's not a style you would probably associate with a roguelike. When I started on the project, all the settings and monsters were very generically fantasy themed. But Terry had expressed wanting to get away from that. Through some back and forth, I was able to redesign all the enemies based on their pre-existing movesets. And we made this wildly varied Alice in Wonderland type of world, where you might fight a vampire, but you might also fight a vacuum, a space marine, or a thief that uses sticky hands to steal your money. Kevin App, in general, I am really interested in doing something different from the dark and serious tone that a lot of roguelikes have. When Marlow Wind and I am on the project, and we started talking about the story side of things seriously. Niall suggested the game show setting, and I loved it. For me, I think it makes a lot of things fall into place the high stakes of what you are doing. A good antagonist that makes sense. Motivations for the characters that work and best of all. It feels light and playful, and does not overwhelm the game or feel too crucial. For our next update, we are planning to add a lot of light story elements to the game in various places. I was a bit worried about this initially, but seeing how it's coming together, I am really excited for people to see it. Our story is lightweight, sure, but it's earnest and fun and makes everything in the game fall into place. Houston, in the early stages of the game, when we were starting to pull the art, music, and gameplay together, I kept getting reminded of 90s game shows every time I played through. There was the luck of the drop, the cute visuals, colors, and ruthlessness that are so akin to that over-the-top cheese. We all adore from that era. From there, things really started to come together. I was able to have a theme to work from. Especially when it came to making the sound effects. I had a lot of fun their game shows are hectic, and so it's almost like an Arduino overload. And from there, you add Burning Ship Tune. Because this is a Terry Kevin Nat game. One of my favorite moments in Double Cross pre-production was when we agreed to try the interdimensional place as the game setting. Worlds with different mechanics. Characters with unique looks, and a huge amount of story ideas that could fit there. Oh, the potential. It was not until a few months later that Alex, our CEO and Double Cross creative director, asked me if I had an investigation system ready for a pitch. Till a few days later, I was confused at first, but he explained to me that an investigation system was the piece that we were missing. After all, 
We were already planning a system of non-linear platforming levels to represent a variety of locations in the multiverse, and were already designing a combat system that do let players confront and capture criminals and evildoers in a highly customizable way. But we had nothing to showcase the detective work and mystery solving aspect of our main character's job. Rift agents are a Sinclair, and having a cool investigation system would add something unique to the action game we were developing. I quickly designed the first iteration of the investigation system. To do that, I took the detective bar tube and thought of a mechanic that could fit in this first iteration. As you beat the game's levels and talk to certain NPCs, you would find items or notes that worked as clues, like you would in Ace Attorney. These were hidden in the levels, like the upgrade EMS. While in the game's hub level at the Rift HQ, you could access Zeris Detective Bar and place clues alongside pictures of characters you do met and locations you do visited. You had a limited amount of red strings that you could use to connect clues, profiles and locations. If an NPC's profile was connected to the right clues or locations with the red string, more dialogue options would be available when talking to them, and you'd be able to unlock further clues, areas, or law.